He's an award-winning reporter at Racket.News. Um, he has written Hate, Inc. He's written I Can't Breathe. He's been on here, the Will Cain Show, before, and I'm glad to have him on again. He is Matt Taibbi. What's up, Matt? It's going well. Man, I'm kind of terrified by this column that you wrote. It's, uh, it's really something else. It's entitled, Is the Electoral Fix Already In? Now, a lot of us, Matt, I think are thinking whatever's going to unfold this year, it hasn't happened yet. I mean, I can imagine we're about to embark on all kinds of censorship. Um, I just got done talking about war, Matt. I mean, historically, you would, be, you would be forgiven for being cynical about an administration launching war efforts in an election year because it normally plays into the incumbent's hands. I'm not sure if that's the case anymore, but you would be forgiven for being cynical about international adventurism during election year. But whatever it is, man, something is coming, and you have really written through that this isn't going to be haphazard. This has actually been war-gamed. What's coming to stop Donald Trump? Yeah, it's really interesting. I mean, I've spent a lot of my career covering presidential campaigns. I've been doing this since 2004. I did it five times for Rolling Stone. And normally at this time of year, all the attention is on voters and what they're thinking. Um, I'm still going to Nevada in a couple of days, and it's still important to talk to people and find out what they're thinking. But this year, there are all these factors that have nothing to do with what voters think that are going to play dominant roles in whether or not um who's who the next president is going to be and this includes things like the lawsuits about uh trump's eligibility in places like colorado and maine uh the lawsuits and technical complaints against third party groups like no labels or robert f kennedy jr the suppression of intramural challenges within the democrat within the democratic party and this is all going to be done by lawyers not by voters and that's something that we haven't seen before and so the, the, the report that you referenced that I wrote um, kind of goes over some of that, but also goes over an exercise that was done in 2020 called the Transition Integrity Project, which, as you say, war gamed out what happens in a contested election scenario and gave us kind of a preview of what the thinking might be about these things. And some of those things are sort of coming to pass a little bit. Let's talk about those things. You, you lay out in this column is the electoral fix already in the four ways, the four things they considered war gaming out what could be, um, I guess, a threat to the transition integrity project. By the way, who's involved in this? Well, I don't want to like loosely use the word they throughout this, but it's I mean, I think the they is very illustrative of what we're talking about. Right before you came in, I'm talking about like disrupting the I just don't think, Matt, and you and I've talked about this. We're on this bipolar spectrum anymore of left and right and what Republican and Democrat mean anymore. And when you look at who's involved in the they, I think it's pretty illustrative. Yes, it's high level Democrats, but not just high level Democrats. Yeah, you're right. I mean, I heard your intro. I'm also one of those people who's been kind of knocked off the axis of party politics. I mean, I and you know, having to learn all over again, although reporters should never have to learn this because it's supposed to be the first order of business. But we don't just get our messaging in a Cracker Jack box from one party or the other. Um, but in this case, in the Trump era, we've had to learn some pretty hard lessons about um, you know, where things really rest, what left and right really mean, whether they're meaningless or meaningful. Um, and that comes out with this TIP project. There are 100 people involved in the Transition Integrity Project, or there were. Uh, there were 67 active participants, according to their own report, and only about a dozen have been identified. Uh, we know who some of them are. There's former DNC chair Donna Brazil, uh, John Podesta, who was the campaign chair for the Hillary Clinton campaign, but there's also Michael Steele, uh, who was the RNC campaign chair. Uh, there are a number of Republicans or you know, like Bill Kristol and David Frum, who were neoconservatives and ardent supporters of the Iraq war invasion. Um, and yeah, it's, it's a bipartisan group there. There are a lot of Democrats there, but there are also a lot of defense and intelligence officials whose political affiliation is not 100 percent clear. So it, it, loosely speaking, it's more of like ins insiders versus outsiders than it is left versus right. All right, and the, this group was put together. I think the timeline's kind of not just interesting, but important. You said it was in 2020. So 
it, it, th- here's why that timing is important. This is pre-January 6th, right? This is pre a lot of the things that they war gamed out. We're going to go over them together in just a moment actually came to pass, but this was put together when in 2020? It looks like it was in June of 2020, probably. Uh, the, the PR campaign about the group's work, they started to do a kind of a launch uh, about their, you know, about the group. The idea behind that was to, to let people know that there was, there were a lot of serious people who were worried about the possibility that Trump might not leave office. And so there were news stories everywhere in July and August of 2020. At that point, most of the exercises had already been conducted. Then they, there was sort of an error. Uh, somebody leaked the most embarrassing part about the report, which is that John Podesta, who was playing the role of Joe Biden in this exercise, in one simulation that involved a quote unquote clear Trump win, uh, he decided not to concede and instead had five states secede, threaten secession um, and, and, and create a constitutional right. crisis. And so this leaked out to the New York in, in Times. The, speci- the specifics of that were something. So the theory was Podesta was playing Biden. Um, Biden loses to Trump or Trump refuses to leave the office. Wasn't it that and then Biden would send unique electors to certain states, uh, special electors that would not follow the results of the Democratic election. And it resulted in California seceding, several West Coast states seceding, Wisconsin seceding as part of this war game. I don't know about Wisconsin. I remember that it was all the West Coast states, which they renamed Cascadia um, and had had all of them secede from the union. Uh, then they entered into negotiations about whether or not they would accept the results of Trump's election. Remember, this was in the case of a clear electoral college victory by Trump, uh, sort of a similar okay. situation as 2016. And they used the threat of secession to extract concessions like uh, the elimination of the electoral college and, and some other um, uh, you know, reforms that they were looking for. Uh, but well, this adding D.C. Happened. and Puerto Rico as states was one of the concessions. Right. Exactly. Yes. A- adding D.C. and Puerto Rico as states. I think there was another thing about the Supreme Court in there. Um, but the important part of this is that it was kind of embarrassing because they were complaining about the possibility that uh, the Trump might not go along with the election results. And of course, we can all talk about whether or not that happened uh, after 2020. Uh, but. In advance of that, it, it's a it's a little bit embarrassing to have people from quote unquote your own side already planning to defy the results of, of an election. And you know, the, there's a lot of stuff in this report that talks about how concerns about uh, Trump's willingness to not leave office or to use extra legal measures might provoke an illiberal response even from Democrats, um, and that also that Democrats cannot rely on quote unquote norms or elite norms to prevent uh, a coup. So that means that they were already preparing to kind of go color outside the lines a little bit. This is, it's kind of an extraordinary document that, that only leaked out because somebody talked to Ben Smith at the New York Times. Uh, and it's really interesting to look at in retrospect and a little scary too. Very scary. And part of me, Matt, wants to be like, okay, well, it's a war game exercise and, you know, you should red team certain scenarios. You know, you should always play out extreme so that you nothing comes as a surprise to you. Like part of me wants to think, okay, that's what's going on. But I think that, that you can't give as much credit to that. Again, as we go through the four scenarios together that they laid out, you're going to see why. But if, and I think you wrote in your column, like this was part of at Barack Obama's encouragement, Podesta went down that path of secession. I think you wrote that. Um, What's I think That's interesting right. about it beyond simply beyond simply like, oh, they're just trying to war game is a they're considering that possibility, meaning it's it's a consideration while accusing everyone else of breaking the norms. And B, if they considered it in 2020, is it considered in 2024? Right. And also you have to look backwards too. did they consider it in 2016 um you know because they they get they go on to list an extraordinary number of quote-unquote abuses that they're worried about trump committing that 
sound an awful lot like things that happened in after 2016, like uh, a series of classified leaks, politicized investigations, uh, you know, things like that. But I, mean, I imagine that's what you're going to go over, want to go over. But yes, there, all those things are concerning. Plus, in 2024, the reason this is now relevant is because we there was just this mysterious story in uh, NBC in the middle of January talking about how yet another loose knit group of officials uh, sponsored by one of the same umbrella groups that was behind the transition integrity project is now reviewing possibilities and wargaming uh, ideas for what to do if Donald Trump makes an illegal order after re-election um, with regard to the Pentagon. So they're already talking about what to do about perhaps creating some kind of resistance to Trump direction uh, of the military, uh, which is like you know, like one of the things that you suggested is uh, forcing the president to seek congressional approval with the deployment of military of the military domestically. Right, exactly. So they're already talking about the, the, the improper use of the Insurrection Act. Now, there's already a bill um, that's been proposed that's probably not going to go anywhere. Uh, but that just tell, it's, it's an indication of what the thinking is. Um, one of the groups that's involved with all this is uh, called Protect Democracy. Uh, they're bankrolled largely by the, um, a couple of groups, including the LinkedIn billionaire, Reid Hoffman. Uh, and, you know, they've been looking at this very issue that, in fact, a couple of their lawyers wrote a story uh, for the New York Times earlier uh, in September of last year talking about how, um, you know, that it's not unusual that uh, people will be looking to use um, insur the Insurrection Act uh, in prosecutions of Donald Trump. And there's a whole long essay about the, the history of it, of the Insurrection Act and how this was interrupted, uh, the use of Ku Klux Klan Act suits and how they can be used as a, as a tool for, for social reform. So their heads are very much in this space of there is this big uh, extra legal gray area involving the Insurrection Act. And what can we do with it? What could somebody else do with it? Matt, well, do you think this is more me asking you to pontificate on this. Do you think um, do you think we've arrived at sort of this this inevitable evolution of a polarized and divided society that that we're at this moment where, you know, you got to ruin democracy, you got to destroy democracy to save democracy. Like we're 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 headed towards this zero sum game of politics, and we always were. Or do you think there was something unique about Donald Trump? that forced this moment where, as we mentioned, it's left, it's right, it's neocon, it's far left, whatever, all, the bedfellows are all mixed at this point, but it all seems to be unified against one man, Donald Trump. I think we have to conclude that there's something unique about Trump. We, we did see after 9-11 that there was a concerted effort to knock down a lot of liberal traditions and rule of law traditions with respect to America's behavior overseas. Um, even domestically, you know, Bush did things like there, there, there was there were incidents, at least one involving an arrest without a warrant, which is something we hadn't seen since the Lincoln years. Uh, but we also saw the elimination of habeas corpus, uh, you know, drone assassination, all these things were revived after 9-11, but it was all overseas. When Trump came along is when we started to see uh, a change in thinking domestically. And this is why, you know, for me, all of this is so shocking. You know, I grew up sort of a political, classic ACLU political liberal. And all of a sudden, all the people who I used to think of as my friends and colleagues, they're, for instance, against free speech. They, they think we must have censorship or else, the, you know, we're headed towards peril. In order to save democracy, we have to kind of curtail the First Amendment. And then you start talking about other amendments they want to they want to cut back on the Fifth Amendment, the 14th Amendment. I mean, there, it, it's it's right on down the line. And I think this is something that goes back to 2016. Before that, we just didn't see this. OK, well, then that forces us into this. Then what is it about Donald Trump? And and I don't want to give you the answer and you're independent minded enough that you won't let me ask you a leading question. But I think about this and I think I've already offered up an opinion today that I think any listener could could follow where I think he did, for whatever reason, did represent 
a threat to the way things had been done for a long time, probably since post-World War II, the way things had been done in Washington, D.C. I mean, he's the first true outsider. And when we say outsider, sometimes that, I think we almost think of that almost too stylistically, you know, but like he just didn't think about things the way that anyone steeped in politics thought about things. And, and so therefore, he did represent a true threat to the way business was done in Washington, D.C. That's option A. And then I'm just trying to be real with myself, Matt. Like, let's consider option B. Option B, red team this. Like, let me – I often think even the craziest person, you have to listen to it for a minute because maybe there's a kernel of truth. You know, so I sit there and ask myself, well, do they have any kernel of truth that Donald Trump represents everything that they say? a true threat to democracy. And I really true try to, do try to ask myself that. Um, and I, I, I think I obviously I come back to option A. That's the answer I think is true, but not without asking myself B. So, but I ask you, then why? What is it about Donald Trump? Yeah, I've come around to um, option A. And this started with my experience as a campaign reporter. I mean, I covered the campaign for years and as a, actually as an investigative journalism story, it's kind of boring. And the reason it was always boring is because the answers are pretty much decided in advance. Um, there were, there's a triumvirate of interests, uh, the press, the two political parties, and the donors. Uh, they're basically impenetrable. They always had been going back decades. If they did not agree on a candidate, that candidate did not get uh, a major party nomination. It just it was impossible. It couldn't happen. The closest that it would, it would ever come was 1992 when Ross Perot spent $18 million and got himself on the ballot, but he didn't really sniff the presidency. In this case, in 2016, uh, Donald Trump overcame all of those uh, influences. And I covered that campaign. I disliked Donald Trump enough to write a book called Insane Clown President about that campaign. But when people said, well, this is a failure of democracy, I, I thought, well, that's crazy. This is this is a huge vindication of democracy because he defeated all of these oligarchical elements that were trying to prevent him from getting elected. Uh, he had half the money that Hillary Clinton had, so he didn't have the donors. His own party was manifestly against his nomination. And the, the press was absurdly against him. I mean, I think the... the um, you know, the endorsements, it was some ridiculous number, like 97 to 2 of the, the, of the major newspapers. So he beat all that. It was, a, it was a crack in the system. I think that's what, that's the norm that they were really concerned about him, um, you know, breaking. Now, after 2020 and January 6th and Stop the Steal, I think the argument becomes more serious, but you have to remember that they were making all these arguments way before January 6th, way before any of that episode, uh, any of those episodes. So I, I, th I think it's option A uh, almost entirely. Maybe, you know, you get a little bit more on the other side now after 2020, but, you know. It, yeah. yeah, but even after 2020, to, to your point, and this is not... What I'm about to say isn't reporting. It's more like follow the logical. If if whatever this, if it's an oligarchy that then is capable of kind of perpetuating a psyop on the American public of high, it's it's psyop in that, yeah, some stuff is manufactured. Some stuff is like giving increased or outsized importance to inconsequential things in the end. His personality, whatever it may be, um, you convince a great amount of the public. That the oligarchy is, you know, right about Donald Trump. Um, if they believe this stuff, I don't know if they really true believe, truly believe that he is a threat to democracy. The way they talk, they would do anything. And I'm not even talking about the election results. I mean, we do know what they did do. We do know about the censorship regime. Now, honestly, man, the way that they speak, I mean, the comparisons to, to Hitler and Nazism and these kind of things like – if you really believe that America was on the verge of losing its constitutional republic, its democracy, that it was on the verge of falling away into Hitlerism, then I don't know what you wouldn't do to stop the man that you think is responsible. Well, right. And, and they've been pretty unequivocal about that, almost unembarrassed about it. I mean, uh, Robert Kagan, 
who's a very influential uh, neoconservative thinker. Uh, his wife, Victoria Newland, is also a very influential diplomat and security official uh, with a lot of um, influence on the you know, prosecution of the, the war in Ukraine. He wrote a, an incredible 6,000 word piece in the Washington Post comparing Trump to Caesar uh, and saying, you know, that, that our democracy is in great peril and no other ordinary um, avenue of resistance is going to work. I mean, the, it, it's almost, it's as close as you can come to calling for an assassination without doing it. It had this ridiculous picture of a, a bust of Caesar on, on the front of the, of the article. But they're all basically saying, well, you know, we have to do whatever it takes to prevent this person from from getting into office. And this is also reflected in the view of, of journalists. I mean, infamously, uh, Sam Harris, who's you know a very influential podcaster, was saying, yeah, we you know, we have to do whatever whatever it takes um, to to get rid of Trump. And this was for a little while anyway, at least the debate within the journalism community. There were a few of us who were, who were saying. We can't just lie about the guy like, you know, that that's not done that 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 will destroy our profession. It will ruin us as an institution. But I would say 90, 95 percent of the people in the business were on the other side of that debate uh, from the beginning. They just something about Trump is so triggering to this group of people uh, that, you know, it's still kind of a mystery to me, actually. I, I don't really fully understand it. It's shocking, honestly, Matt, that there hasn't, I mean, I hate to say this, it sounds so inflammatory when you talk about this, but like, it, it, you just step back for a minute and you go, it is kind of shocking there hasn't been an attempt on his life. I mean, you've got, you know, it's, you You could argue, by the way, it undercuts all the conspiracies of assassination because all of the powers that be behind the scenes are marshaled against Trump and it hasn't manifested in that, you know, and on the, on the front end, you've also ginned up a great amount of like, you know, populist or anti-populist hatred of Trump that could could inspire a mass lone wolf, right? I, it, the, the, you just kind of look at this from a distance and you go, it's shocking that this hasn't been the final step in stopping Donald Trump. Yeah, I mean, I think they've already been very successful in getting people to go way beyond the confines of what their normal behaviors would be. Uh, you know, it, it starts with stuff as simple as, you know, the censorship issue. There are people who would never have considered, uh, you know, interfering on a mass scale with speech, who suddenly became very ardent converts to that idea after 2016. Uh, this, I, this sort of lawfare conversion of the left liberal advocacy space. I mean, I came up again. I, I, I did a lot of stories with groups like the ACLU crew, you know, back in the day, the League of Women Voters, the, all these groups that were pursuing sort of issue driven uh, initiatives to try to do things like integrate the workplace or prevent housing discrimination or whatever it is, all that's gone. The, it's all partisan warfare now that you have a, this huge flowering of these little bureaucracies that do nothing but, but stuff like generate nuisance lawsuits against Republican politicians or Trump related politicians or try to generate bar complaints against uh, Trump connected lawyers they're doing the same thing to some of the third party groups now this is warfare this is not this is not advocacy anymore and who knows where it will lead that it's it's kind of scary you you brought up yeah it's very scary. you brought up this um letter i think it was obtained by semaphore it was sent was this sent to the no labels party people talking about third party um in no, the Zoom meeting where, where they were talking about this is what we need to this is the message we need to put out um, so to third party support. candidates or third party par, it, it, like one of the lines is basically if you have one fingernail clipping of a skeleton in your closet we will find it we're going to come at you with every gun we can possibly find that's that's a threat to the Jill Steins of the world to the RFK juniors of the world to the no labels of the world yeah, it, it's incredible. I mean, the no labels for people who don't know, it's this new kind of third party group. It's interesting. It's got the former NAACP director in it. Joe Lieberman's in it. The former Republican governor of North Carolina is in it. So it's it's sort of a hodgepodge of both left and right ideas, but it just wants something different. Um, they had there was a former Democratic Party 
uh, lawyer named Holly Page, uh, they ended up sending a letter to the Department of Justice complaining about the harassment they'd received. She was visited by another former Democratic Party lawyer who basically said, you'll never work in this town again. Uh, you know, you have to get you have to stop being involved with this group. And then then mentions, you know, I wonder what your your biggest client, Connie, thinks about all this and mentions that, you know, one, one of this woman's uh, firm's biggest clients. Within weeks, she gets a call from the client saying, sorry, we're, we're not going to be using your services anymore because you're persona non grata at the White House. So this is how they're operating. This is this is like, you know, bottom line politics. If you don't go along with the program, we're going to hit you in the wallet. We're going to hit you and, you know, your ability to use the, the Internet. I mean, it's a million different things. This is this is all new. This is stuff we did overseas, not domestically. It's just it's incredible. So I want to, I've teased it several times, but in that um, transition integrity project, they laid out four threats that they worried about Donald Trump committing, right? That, that predicated, um, I don't know, uh, predicated every, every response necessary to save democracy. Um, I want to go through them really quickly with you because again, remember this was done. This, this project was put together in the summer of 2020. So the Hunter Biden laptop story had begun to percolate, but hadn't yet made its way into the full censorship mode, meaning John Paul MacIsaac had already reached out to the FBI that it happened. But, but summer of 2020, so a lot of, as I read this, you're going to realize nothing had yet happened. So one thing they worried about Don, uh, Donald Trump doing is restricting Internet access in the name of national security. They worried about him embarking on a censorship regime. Yeah, I mean, uh, and I wrote there all I could, all my site can do is laugh at that. I spent the last year, you know, doing with the Twitter file stuff, going through how, you know, how Democratic Party officials and their associated um, adv advocacy groups spent eight years doing this stuff. So, yeah, it, it, it's laughable that they would think that. And then, and then obviously afterwards, they, they used it heavy handedly in the years after 2020. Number two, they were worried that Donald Trump would allege foreign interference in an election in order to cast doubt on its outcome, which is exact. This is exactly well, that was what was done after 2016. 2016, 2018, 2020. I mean, it, I actually got to a point where I couldn't count anymore the number of news articles that came out where unnamed or even in many cases named officials came out and warned that the Russians were going to interfere in the election. Um, after 2016, of course, there was a there was an intelligence community assessment. There's going to be some reporting that's going to come out about that soon, um, you know, concluding that Russians interfered to help Trump. Then there were years there was years and years of reporting about that um, that ended up collapsing mostly. Then in 2018, they said the Russians are going to interfere until the elections went a certain way, after which they said they, they didn't succeed. Then in 2020, the same pattern happened again. So there's so much of this, it's just laughable that they would talk about it that way. Number three, they said uh, they're worried about a classified intelligence release. Now, I'm not... To, this is where your reporting comes in. Is I see you already shaking your head. Is that something? Is that a sin they've already committed in the past three years since this three four years since this was released? Massively, yeah. Um, there, you know, the the use of uh, classified leaks uh, and leaking those to reporters um, was a constant feature of the of the Trump era. It started really before uh, he was even elected. There, there was the intelligence community assessment. There was language from uh, the intelligence community assessment about Russian interference, which got um, published on January 6, 2017. There was language from that that was in news reports in the month before that. So they were already leaking news of a classified intelligence uh, assessment um, long before it came out. Uh, then there was the- To incident. oppose Trump. Right, yes. Um, then the, the incident involving Michael Flynn talking to the Russian ambassador, that was classified signals intelligence that you're not allowed to leak to reporters. Actually, that's one of the few areas where reporters aren't even allowed to publish the stuff, um, technically. Uh, then there was a series of leaks. There was one to the New York Times about, um, about Trump having repeated access to contacts with Russian intelligence. 
uh, there were there were others involving you know the Eric Prince and the Seychelles having contacts with Russians. It just went on and on and on over and over again. And it was a massively underreported story throughout the Trump years. And then finally, number four of the things they were concerned Trump would do is that he would launch investigations into his political opponents. That's again laughable considering what's happened to him. Uh, all these investigations launched against him. But again, I think the point, Matt, is like this is what they were talking about in 2020. Then we know what happened afterwards. So all the sins and all the big concerns and hand-wring they had about Donald Trump are things that they actually did. It's not unlike what we talk about. I actually I think people that accuse other people of being racist often harbor the most racist uh, thoughts internally or whatever it may be. I, it's like accuse your opponent of the sins you are committing. And here we have it. They war gammed at the worst of Trump and then did the worst of Trump. Right. And on one hand, as he was a candidate, I can see being concerned about that in 2016, because I remember being at his rallies where he would start it off by saying, lock her up, lock her up, right? Which suggests that he's going to get into office and launch a, a criminal investigation against Hillary Clinton. But that never happened. I mean, he never did that stuff. Donald Trump people have to go penetrate the talk with Donald Trump and get get down to the reality of what he is. Some of the things that he says are outrageous and outrageously offensive. But when you get down to what he actually did, it, it, it turns out to be a much smaller story in many cases. And you're absolutely right. The history of politicized investigations, there just aren't a lot of them. You could argue maybe the, the first impeachment case was a was an instance of them trying to gin up an investigation against Hunter Biden, but that's pretty mild compared to the stuff that con that concretely demonstrably happened in the other direction. So th the purpose of looking back to this thing in 2020 is to a point out the ways in which this was all done, you know, in order to save I mean, everything they worried about, they were willing to commit in order to quote unquote save democracy, but also to look forward to 2024 in the next couple of months, the next year, essentially, because I think it's it's probably going to bleed over post-election as well, is what will be done? I mean, what will be done this year? I think we can count on censorship, but what else will be done to stop Donald Trump? I mean, th there will certainly be legal actions. I mean, we've already seen we've got 120 criminal accounts, however many of them. Um, they're already out there. The, the argument that he's uh, an insurrectionist needs to be kept off the ballot. Those cases are still ongoing. Uh, but there's also the, the ongoing issue of who's going to be on the ballot in what states. Remember, this is this could very easily be a decisive factor in the election. If no labels gets a candidate on there, if our Robert F. Kennedy Jr. gets on the ballot, um, both of those uh, parties have enough money to do the job of actually getting collecting the signatures. So there's going to be an awesome effort to try to prevent that from happening because there's a strong belief in Washington that that would swing the election to Trump if they were to, 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 to do that. So that's something you have to worry about. And, you know, you have to worry about other things like intimidation of local officials. Are, are, they, are they going to be worried about getting, you know, cast out of uh, or losing clients if they get involved in in certain kinds of defense of, uh, you know, of politicians or or being tied to a group like the Green Party. Um, you know, this this is all stuff that's very real and it's not gonna have anything to do with what voters think. That's that's the key part <laughs> to keep coming back to is that, you know, they don't want this thing to be settled at the polls. I mean, I know I hate to use that generic they, but I think it's true in this case. Yeah, yeah, that's the point in the end. <laughs> It's killing democracy in the name of saving democracy. Um, it's it's an incredible column. Again, is the electoral fix already in? It's like a lot of Matt's work. It's something you absolutely need to check out at racket.news. Go subscribe. It's if you care about the truth. It's it's where you should spend your money. Uh, Matt, always appreciate you coming on, man. Thanks so much, Will, and thanks thanks for having me on. It's it's great to talk to you.